Coming to this time and place has been a long journey for me, spiritually and theologically. I entered seminary in my late 40s. I was a bit of a late bloomer, I think in part because there were no role models for female clergy in the Roman Catholic tradition in which I was raised. Uh, when I was a very young child, I had a natural understanding of what we call God as a loving and encouraging presence. This presence was not anthropomorphic, it wasn't male or female, it was just an encouraging and loving presence. It was at Claremont School of Theology that my mind became expanded. I reread all sorts of different theologians who all had different lenses through which they saw God and theology. We read black, Asian, Latin American, and feminist theologians, and it was fantastic to have my mind expanded like that. But deconstruction is also, it makes you lose your equilibrium. Amen. And, amen. <laughs> no, <laughs> I worried that somehow I was being disloyal to God or to Jesus. But anyway, as time went on, that natural understanding I had as a small child didn't mesh with the things I was being taught. I learned that God is a male who lives far away in an ethereal place called heaven. I was taught that I am unworthy to approach this God and that I needed a male priest to mediate God for me. I pictured this father God to look like the figure on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And I imagine a lot of you had that same image in your mind. When I was a youth in middle, middle school, the nun taught our catechism class. That's where children learn the tenets of Roman Catholicism, that women are the gateway to sin. Women are responsible for bringing evil into the world because of Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. And all women carry this disgrace throughout time. To be honest with you, I didn't really absorb what the nun said. It just sort of floated in the cultural waters that I was swimming in at that time. In that day and age, religion was pervasive and there was no room for questions. And gender attitudes were in place firmly. World without end. Amen. I can't help but think of what it might have been like if instead of a disempowered and disgraced Eve, we had learned about the wonderful figure of Sophia, wisdom, from the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew, her name is Hokma. In the Greek of the New Testament, she is called Sophia. And she is intimately connected to God and intertwined throughout creation. Sophia delights in all of humanity. Before God ever thought of the first fertile green soil or springs of water, we are told that Sophia was there like a master worker. I'd like to read to you a few verses from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 8, 23 through 31. God created me at the beginning of God's work, the first of God's acts long ago. Ages ago, I was set up, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When God had not yet made earth and fields, or the world's first bits of soil, when God established the heavens, I was there. When God drew a circle on the face of the deep, when God made firm the skies above, when God established the fountains of the deep and assigned the, to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress divine command, when God marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside God like a master worker. I was daily God's delight. Rejoicing before God always, rejoicing in the inhabited world, and delighting in the human race.
We are told from the book of Proverbs that Sophia calls out to all people. We're all included in her in invitation regardless of our beautiful diversity. She says, to you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all who live. Maybe we can learn to hear this ancient voice and see what is new and renewing for us in her message for us today. Scholar and theologian Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, sorry, sorry, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> She writes that in the earliest layers of Christianity, Sophia was a prominent figure, but that she has been almost completely erased from our Western tradition. At the time, in the early days, there were two prominent ways of answering, who is Jesus? One way is, was that Jesus is the Son of God, and this is so prominent that it often seems like the correct answer when you ask, who is Jesus? But unfolding right alongside this idea was God as the embodiment of wisdom. This was before any creeds or doctrines were developed. These two ideas were unfolding. <coughs> Sophia, Elizabeth Schusler Filarenza writes that in the beginning there was a mutuality within Christianity two streams of thought were unfolding simultaneously. Jesus was seen as both the son of God and the, um, the child of Sophia. Indeed, Fia Urenza writes that Jesus probably understood himself as the child and prophet of Sophia. It seems that Jesus had a strong connection to wisdom. In Matthew, he writes, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he, was a, a de he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So Jesus spoke of himself as wisdom. The wisdom tradition contains elements of open-endedness, inclusivity, creation spirituality, liberation, and transformation. Episcopal priest and modern mystic, Reverend Dr. Cynthia Bourgeau writes that for the earliest Christians, Christianity was supremely a wisdom path. A Christianity that is inspired by a path or a way is a wisdom tradition. The earliest followers of Jesus called themselves the followers on the way, the people of the way. Bourgeau writes that the earliest Christians didn't see Jesus so much as a savior, as a, mas as a master of consciousness who invites you on a path where you too can become enlightened like him. One reason this might seem very different from what we're used to is that it, the emphasis is on how we can follow a path to become more like Jesus rather than how utterly different we are from him. The emphasis is not on our sinfulness or fallen nature. The emphasis is on our potential. Wisdom is a propensity to see clearly. Wisdom gives life. If you, were to, if you were asked, how did Jesus teach, you might answer, Jesus taught with parables. Parables are concerned with the transformation of our consciousness. They are not like proverbs that speak of virtuous living and conventional thinking. They are meant to turn our usual way of thinking upside down. For example, Jesus said that the realm of God is like a woman who adds yeast to unleavened bread. At the time that the people first heard this, it would have seemed like a dangerous image because yeast was thought to be an unclean substance for Jewish people of that time. It's also subversive that it is a woman who is bringing forth the realm of God through her kneading of the, the lifeless dough and the yeast. Parables are open-ended. The story element invites us to enter in and be a part of things. We, we think that 
with some massaging action, with the yeast and the dough, and alchemy can take place. And with the help of God, change can happen. Something new can emerge, but our participation is needed to bring it forth. On the wisdom path, there is, in all times and places, there is a chance and a possibility to become something more. As I touched upon in my story from my youth, many of us have a long history of being told that we are born in sin and we are unworthy to approach God. But here comes Sophia to tell us that we are good and not only that, we are God's delight. Of course, we make mistakes and we have growing to do, but here's Sophia inviting us forward on a path that leads to reaching our fullest potential as children of God. Both Jesus and Sophia speak of a God who pours out beautiful gifts to people with love and joy. They speak of banquets, sumptuous and beautiful banquets, where everyone is welcome. We have only to accept the invitation. These themes remind me of a 1987 film called Babette's Feast. In the film, the two elderly sisters, Philippa and Martine, are carrying on their father's legacy. He was the prophet founder of an austere Christian sect. They carry on their acts of charity with the help of a maid, Babette, who appeared on their doorstep 14 years earlier on one stormy night. Babette was a refugee from the French Civil War, and her husband and her son had died. Babette had also been an accomplished chef in France. These characters live in a stony, barren land in 19th century Denmark. Their meals consist of an unappetizing offering of ale bread and split cod. One day, Babette learned that she had won 10,000 francs in the French lottery. A friend of hers had renewed the ticket for her every year. Babette thought about what she might do with that money, and she asked the sisters if she could prepare just once a real French meal. She would serve it in honor of their father, the founding pastor. The sisters reluctantly agreed. Babette began ordering her supplies, the, the likes of which the sisters had never dreamed of, live quail and turtles, wines. The sisters worried that something akin to a witch's Sabbath was about to take place. So they ran to warn the other disciples. All agreed that they would attend the banquet, but with their minds on other things, as if they had no taste buds. <laughs> Whoops. The guests arrive in somber dress and demeanor, in great contrast to the sumptuous meal that was placed before them. And as, they, as the meal proceeded, the guests became aware of a transformation taking place. The miracle resided not only in the food that they were eating, but became embodied in the community itself. There was a forgiveness of past lapses and grudges, and not only that, these things were seen in a new and transfigured light. By the time the guests left the table, they were created anew. They spilled out onto the market square, and a spontaneous circle dance took place under the moonlight there. The guests had experienced a miracle through the food because of Babette's artistry. As they slowly opened to the beauty of the beautiful feast, they were warmed and changed. These things remind me of Sophia's table, which is I picture as large and round, where everyone has a, a seat and all the seats are equal distance from the center of power. Sophia is continuing to call us forward on a path that leads to transformation, empowerment, and growth. I'm not saying that Sophia equals God any more than God is summed up by that figure on the Sistine Chapel. Our metaphors and doctrines will never be able to capture the depth of our creator, but I do welcome a time and a place where we can consider a more balanced and deeper understanding of God and what God might be like. Amen. Those who were deemed 
nobodies by the old law are given a new invitation to the table. We can look back at a time when there was a mutuality between Sophia and Jesus, between wisdom and Jesus, but we also need to look forward. We can integrate and maintain those parts of our tradition which ring true in a timeless sense while shedding old patriarchal forms. It is time for the kaleidoscope to turn so that we see the full depth and beauty of our creator, which of course contains elements of feminine, masculine, and everything in between. The banquet is re ready, the table is set. Come and take your place at the table, knowing that you reflect unique and beautiful facets of the divine, and that she delights in you. Amen. Amen.